morning and welcome dear friends. In the previous module, we had started the discussion of gender blurring in Tony Morrison. In this module, we would continue with the same discussion. As we have discussed previously, gender blurring involves conventional characteristics of women as well as men. It suggests that as per the traditional and cultural perceptions, there are certain characteristics which are normally associated with masculinity as well as with femininity. So, when a man behaves in such a manner which is conventionally expected to be that of a woman and vice versa, we understand this to be an instance of gender blurring. In the novels of Toni Morrison, we find that the concept of gender blurring normally attributes weak female character traits to men and strong male character traits to women, consequently impairing manhood and also opposing conventional restrictions for women characters. In the previous modules, we have looked at parallels with the drag as well as with the queer theory in the context of gender blurring. We can also say that the concept of gender blurring also presages postmodernist theories of power. And here I would like to refer to Foucault, the famous French postmodernist who has been hugely influential in shaping our understanding of power in contemporary discourse. We find that Foucault has shifted away from the theoretical discussions of power, not only from those actors who have used power as instruments of coercion, but also he has shifted away from those discrete institutions and structures within which such actors operate. So, according to Foucault, power is everywhere, it is diffused and embodied in discourse, knowledge and what he has termed as regimes of truth. Foucault has remarked that power is not episodic, rather it is dispersed as well as pervasive. Similar ideas can be seen when we look at Toni Morrison's novel in the context of gender blurring and her depiction of the slavery as an institution in erstwhile USA. In his idea of force relations, Foucault has looked at power as an effect of difference, inequality or unbalance that exists in unconventional forms of relationships, for example, sexual or economic relationships. So, force or power is not limited to something that a person or an institution or a group holds over others. In a state, power is a complex group of forces that comes from everything and therefore, it exists everywhere. In the previous module, we have looked at how Morrison's novel the bluest eyes looks at the phenomena of gender blurring. We now begin our discussion of Sulla as an illustration of this concept. Sulla is Morrison's second novel which was published in 1973. It primarily interprets female relationships of mother and daughter in the instance of Eva and Anna Pease and also of two women friends by illustrating the relationship between Sulla and Nell. The novel has a circular structure and using evocative language, Morrison has presented the texture of these women's lives and experiences and describes the manner in which they have faced societal challenges, adopting different and separate gender characteristics in order to eke out their independent lives. The novel is set in a small Ohio town during 1919 to 1965. During these decades of change, it chronicles the fortunes of women in two matriarchal households within the black community whose lives represent the range of choices which were possible for black women in contemporary America. One of the primary suggestions of Morrison in this novel is that the pressures and the false values which have been forced upon black people by the dominant white society hamper the stability of black family in general 
and of women in particular. She also depicts how the institution of marriage for instance is regarded by male and female alike under the influence of white culture. Regardless of their social or economic standing, regardless of their own backgrounds of a different culture, all the residents of the bottom that is the locality which is depicted in the novel share the common belief that a woman is incomplete and is able to find respectability and fulfillment only when she becomes the mate of another man, particularly within the institution of marriage. The trope of friendship, which is a fundamental one in this novel between Nil Wright and Sula Pace begins when they are adolescent girls and continues as they mature. Their friendship also changes in nature, but remains the deepest attachment and a most profound influence on their lives. In terms of unfolding selfhood, these two girls had commonly shared dreams, but they approach this task of maturation indifferently. After high school, Nell has decided to marry and settle down in a conventional role of a wife and mother, whereas Sula has followed a wildly different path. Immediately after Nell's wedding, Sula leaves town and she returns after a gap of 10 years. Her quest for knowledge and experience she must have experienced during these 10 years is described only in retrospect. Her experiences at college, her travels as well as her romantic liaison are mentioned in parenthesis and she remembers them mostly as boring and unalluring. She finds people following the same dreary routines everywhere and therefore she returns to bottom and we can also say that she returns to Nil who is the central focus and attachment in her life. Sula has embodied freedom, adventure, curiosity and passion unlike her friend Nil. Sula perceives herself as free and she thinks that she alone is capable to be honest towards her life to experience it fully, to experiment with her own self also independently. In comparison to other women, she finds that her journey is an enactment of this freedom. However, her negation of these conventional bonds of matrimony has rendered her an outcast in the eyes of her community. The women of the bottom hate her because for them she is a living criticism of their lives which are full of resignation. Interestingly, by rejecting Sula, people in her community unite together in their criticism of her. Society's conviction that Sula is an evil changes them in a mysterious manner. They begin to cherish their relationships, take care of each other, repair their homes in general, bend together against the evil in their midst and have a more fulfilling life in general. Contrary to expectation, when Sula dies, bad luck follows. However, the wisdom which Sula has attained is that of a cynic. Even though Tony Morrison has depicted her as an independent character, somehow the independence is not at par with the independence of a male protagonist who is presented in patriarchal narratives. And herein, we can say that there remains a lacuna in the characterization of Tony Morrison. While the heroic journey and sexual outcasts in patriarchal narratives are typically a source of power for men, this somehow is not the case for Sula. We can say that she is free but directionless. For a male hero, sexuality, sexual conquest and marriage are often depicted as ultimate adventures, representing an increase in his power and attainments. Whereas Sula's sexuality breeds only boredom and described. She has also been depicted as an artist without a medium, dangerous because undirected, lacking discipline or aim. We can also say that she is free but empty. She also never makes the existentialist commitment, the surrender of freedom through attachment to an idea or a person 
that critics like Simone de Beauvoir and others see as the truest hallmark of human freedom. Her one human relationship of significance is her friendship with Nell, which provides her with a center, a place she can call home. Nell has reproached her in the beginning, and I quote from the text, You can't do it all. You a woman and a colored woman at that. You can't act like a man, unquote. Still we find that by keeping herself outside the sex, race and class definitions of the society, Sula does not aim to have any material ambitions. When Eva asks her about the possibility of marriage and having children, Sula suggests that she does not want to make somebody else, she wants to make herself. She has extracted choices from choicelessness, as Morrison has remarked in her text. She rebels against the role she is assigned to take within the black community. She has confessed to Nell that she has got her mind and what goes on in it. Her determination to achieve self-fulfillment has allowed her to live in the world, but not to be caught in the spider web-like life of women in bottom. The concept of gender blurring is also evident in the portrayal of Eva, who is the grandmother of Sula. We can also say that Sula has inherited her courage and rebellious nature from her grandmother Eva. Eva is an influential character who is respected by people in general for having a patriarchal personality. After she has been deserted by her husband, she has decided to survive alone despite the hardships because she wanted to save her children from starvation and sure death. Her love for her family has given her courage to sacrifice everything for her children. When she sees that her son sinks into addiction and she is not able to save him from sinking further, she takes a dramatic decision to relieve him from his addiction by killing him. She burns him in his sleep explaining that she could not tolerate seeing her son behaving like an infant again due to drug addiction. And I quote from the text, I done everything I could to make him leave me and go on and live and be a man, but he couldn't and I had to keep him out. So I just thought of a way he could die like a man, not all scrunched up inside my womb, but like a man, unquote. Out of her maternal love, she saves him from his misery, thinking that his death is better than his addiction. Killing of one's own child by mothers is a thematic trope which has repeatedly been used by Toni Morrison in her novel. At this point, I would only comment that it is an illustration of gender blurring. Later on, when I shall be concluding my discussion on Toni Morrison, I would take up this motif in detail again. Another major character in the novel is Nell. Earlier in her life, she had to watch her mother's humiliation by a white racist train conductor. After having witnessed this episode, she had determined never to lose her own individuality, to gather power and joy and to possess what she terms as her meanness. To a certain extent, she is able to accomplish this goal through her friendship with Sula, a friendship which her mother does not approve of it. Still in contrast to Sula, Nell comes across as a traditional and conventional lady who lives with limited self-expression of gender identified roles. If we quote from the text, we find that Morrison has used strong terms to depict it. After marriage, she solidifies into her wifely role, becoming one of the women who had, quote, folded themselves into starched coffins, unquote. Her meanness, the qualities she had vowed to hold on forever, begin to erode when she marries Jude. In marrying Jude, she is chosen. She does not do the choosing. And we find that the lack of agency is transparent in the description of the details of her marriage. She hopes that by agreeing to the marriage proposal, she hopes that the dreams and hopes of her husband would also become hers. 
However, we find that ultimately she ends up giving up her own dreams. We can also say that she has adopted and also authenticated the dreams of her mothers and in a way of the black community for women also. Traditional ideals of happiness through marriage, motherhood and religiously sanctimonious piety are also displayed in her character depiction by Johnny Morrison. The friendship which has been depicted in the novel between Sula and Nell is also an example of bonding which has always existed amongst black women. It also provides them skills for bare survival in a difficult world. Sula is passionate and sexual while Nell is good, conventional and controlled. Still they are two independent human beings. Black women have been devalued in their societies, but Morrison has portrayed them as being able to survive without the help of men by assuming masculine roles. It is particularly evident in the character portrayal of Sula and her grandmother. Another example of gender blurring is seen in the portrayal of Shedrick, a World War I combat soldier in one of the all black units. He had volunteered to do combat in the war, but he returns to the bottom as a mental cripple. His masculinity has been systematically deconstructed by his own experiences and also by his inability to challenge them. He does not return to the US as a war hero. He also refuses to participate in the famous New York parade celebrating the return of the fighting 369th. He is terrified of his swift unanticipated that that he decides to create a day and dedicate it to the monsters he fears most and that is the sudden unexpected death that comes without warning. He is unable to mingle and therefore lonely and he is unable to face the society. His portrayal can be contrasted with the character sketch of Sula and her grandmother. Shedrick believes that people and things need boundaries to provide order in an otherwise disorderly world. After he is released from the boundaries of the military hospital, he begins to experience panic, pain, fear and the hysteria of helplessness and decides to cut himself off from the society. We can see by this discussion that Morrison's characters behave differently from what may be expected of them within conventional gender norms. With very few exceptions, Morrison's female characters are firmly independent and subvert the traditionally assigned roles of dutiful wife, mother and daughter. Of this category, Sula and Eve are the most prominent. Nell, who like her mother, has accepted the passive role of wife, mother and daughter without questioning them, also comes to recognize the power of womanhood by the time the novel ends, although it does not become clear to the reader just what she will decide to do with this newfound knowledge. Another novel which is often quoted in the context of gender blurring is Morrison's 1987 novel, Beloved. It is a successful challenge by her to remember the 60 million Africans who gave away their lives in the transatlantic slave trade journey. It is a fifth work of fiction by her and for it Morrison had received the 1988 Pulitzer Prize. This novel has been inspired by a true event of a fugitive black slave with the name of Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner had killed her daughter when she was about to be caught under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 by her white master. This incident has inspired several works of art. On the left hand side of this slide, we can look at an 1867 painting by Thomas Noble which is also based on Garner's story. Some other fictional works have also been inspired by Garner's story. For example, Billy Scott by John Jolliffe in 1856, Fifth Season by Jamison in 2015 and 
a Coven's Lament by Simpson in 2017. In 1859, a poem was also composed by Francis Harper with the title Slave Mother, A Tale of Ohio. Tony Morrison had also written the libretto for the opera Margaret Garner in 2005, which was composed by Richard Denilpore. The novel Beloved is divided into three sections. Each section begins with a description of the house in which the main characters live. Through a series of flashbacks and dialogues in the present, readers gradually learn about major events in the lives of people who have all been ruined by slavery. Part 1 of the novel begins with a short and pithy statement, 124 was spiteful. The ghost of a dead baby is haunting this house at 124 Bluestone Road in the outskirts of Cincinnati. Sethe is a former slave who lives in this house with her daughter Denver and also the ghost who has now become a part of their lives. Denver's grandmother and Sethe's mother-in-law, Baby Suggs, had died. Paul D., who was a former slave who used to work at the same plantation where Sethe used to be, also arrives at this house, drives out the ghost and moves in. Just as all of them are getting used to the new family arrangement, a strange woman arrives at this place. She does not know where she is from, but she tells them that her name is Beloved. Sethe and Denver are immediately drawn to this strange woman. They feed her and care for her as if she were an infant. Sethe begins to answer certain strange questions which are asked by Beloved. Questions which contain details of the past that only Sethe knew about. Denver therefore comes to believe that Beloved is the ghost of a dead sister. Paul D. feels irritated with this presence and leaves the house. Through a flashback in this section, the reader learns how the former slave master had arrived at 124 to capture Sethe and her children to take them back to sweet home the plantation in Kentucky. Rather than face the despicable life again, Sethe had tried to kill her children in herself. Part 2 begins with the statement that 124 is loud. Sethe is content with her life inside 124 with Denver and Beloved. She no longer minds talking about her horrific past. Beloved tells Sethe that she has come from the other side. Sethe interprets it in the manner that this strange girl is a dead baby who has come back to her. She tries to explain to Beloved repeatedly that she had killed her not out of malice or ill will but as an act of love. Part 3, which is the last part of the novel, states that 124 was quiet. Sethe has stopped working at the restaurant and everyone in the house is starving. As whatever meager savings they had, they had squandered on colorful clothes and decorations that delight beloved. Denver has been shunned and Sethe now spends all her time with beloved. It is at this juncture that Mr. Baldwin, who is Denver's boss, approaches the house to pick up Denver for work. Sethe sees him and mistakes him to be the former master who has come back again to take her and Beloved back to the plantation. She attacks him with an ice pick but is stopped by Denver and other women. At this moment, Beloved vanishes never to return. Sethe loses her mind and lies down to die as her mother-in-law, Baby Suggs, had. Denver has a good job now and is working hard towards attending college. Paul D. at this moment returns to Sethe to tell her that he wants a future with her, getting her back up on her feet to walk again. The members of this house along with their community now have been released from the tragedy and trauma of Beloved and they are now able to move forward towards a better life. This novel is often quoted as an example of gender blurring. Before going further to a detailed illustration of examples of gender blurring, 
I would introduce an interview of Toni Morrison in which she explains the idea behind writing the novel Beloved and expresses her sympathies towards the mother who had to sacrifice her children in order to save them from slavery. Toni Morrison, what inspired this theme? I read an article in the 19th century newspaper about a woman whose name was Margaret Garner, who had indeed killed or tried her children. She was a fugitive slave, and um, rather than have them go back, she decided to take them all into a permanent place of oblivion. And it was uh, an article that stayed with me for a long, long time and seemed to have in it an extraordinary uh, idea that was worthy of a novel, which was this compulsion to nurture, this ferocity that a woman has to be responsible for her children, and at the same time, the kind of tensions that exist in trying to be a separate, complete individual. You've said that uh, she has no, she had no right to do it, but I would have done the same thing. I mean, Tell it me was that. the right thing to do, but she had no right to do it. I think I felt the the claims. You see, those women were not parents. They could have. They were they, people insisted that they have children. But they could not be mothers because they had nothing to say about the future of those children, where they went. They could make no decisions. They frequently couldn't even name them. So that they were denied humanity in a number of ways. But they were denied uh, that role, which is um, early, uh, I mean, has nothing to do with history. It's what women do. And so she claimed something that she had no right to claim, which was the property of her children, and claimed it so finally that she decided that she could not only dictate their lives, but end them. And when one knows what the life, what their future would be, her decision is not that difficult to understand. You, you've talked about previous accounts of slavery being simplistic and, and not probing the interior being of, of the characters. Is this, how, how difficult was it for you to probe the interior being of characters, albeit black, still from a long, long time ago? Exactly. Well, my disappointment in some of the accounts uh, was based on the fact that this is so large, you see. And then the big problem is that slavery is so intricate, so immense, and so long, and so unprecedented, that you can let slavery be the story, the plot. And we know where that story is, and it is predictable. And then you do the worst thing, which is you de you, the center of it becomes the institution and not the people. So if you focus on the characters and their interior life, it's like putting the authority back into the hands of the slave rather than the slaveholder. What is the rationale for the ghost? <laughs> First of all, I really wanted her past, her memories, her haunting memories, not to be abstract. I wanted her to actually sit down at the table with the thing she's been trying to avoid and explain away, which is this past, this terrible thing that happened, to confront it as a way of saying that's what the past is. It's a living thing. There's this relationship between ourselves and our personal history and our racial history and our national history that sometimes gets made, you know, sort of distant. But if you make it into a person, then it's inescapable to confrontation. The other was that it was part of the milieu of black people to think in terms of a very intimate relationship between the living and the dead. They didn't have that, you know, sort of uh, modern dismissal. They didn't dismiss those things. We would continue our discussion of Beloved in the next module. Thank you.